So. Okay, let's continue with the talks. Next one will be given by Honza Kral from Elasticsearch, and he's going to share his experience with centralized logging. Hello? Can anybody hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Finally, somebody who ne knows how to properly answer a question. So, uh, to continue with the questions, uh, how many of you here a use any form of centralized logging? Good, a majority. So, just in case of the minority, does everybody understand what a centralized logging is? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> just because I'm just not prepared to explain that part. Uh, so, uh, who here actually uses Logstash? You guys are awesome. The, ne uh, the rest of you will actually have a chance after I'm finished. Uh, so, first, some, some propaganda. Uh, why do you want to use centralized logging? Why do you want to uh, go through all the effort and dedicate the resources, both human and technical, to actually deal with this? Uh, so, uh, the first reason why to do so is when somebody wakes you up at 3 in the morning and tells you something is wrong, that, that happens. And then you need to log into your servers. Typically, you have more than one, so you need to log into five and start prepping files. And typically, it's not just one file because you need to check the web application log, the database log, the load balancer logs, the Redis logs, and everything, and then try to piece together a picture of what's actually going on. At that point, you are essentially a, a human interface to grep. Is that a position that you applied for? If so, everything is perfectly fine. If not, I would suggest that you give centralized logging a try because it can act, uh, free you of, of being an interface to grep. And don't get me wrong, grep is an awesome tool, but for some things, it's very hard to use. For example, these are all the different formats that at some point somebody thought was a good idea to use in log. Uh, so, this one is pretty okay, but seriously, like a text-based log, text-based in log, and how do you actually filter that you want just two days, 31st of January and 1st of February? Not possible. This one, okay, you can at least sort, but like seriously, when you see a log message, can you can you see what it meant? This one, what? Which year was it? Like typically, it's not an issue, but sometimes when you when you archive the logs, at least. It can, it can be hard and brutal, like as if dealing with timestamps were not difficult enough. So this is just one example of what's wrong with just raw logs. So let's actually go through the steps that you need to make your life easier. First, you need to collect the data, whether they come from files or sockets or they're shipped to you, uh, Via, via messenger pigeon, you just need to collect them somehow. Then you need to parse it. You need to deal with all the possible formats uh, and you need to standardize it somehow and extract the information from it. Then you typically want to enrich the information in some way. You're not really interested in an IP address. You want, you want a host name, right? So that's an example of enriching the data. Then you need to store it somewhere. And that storage needs to be able to do uh, search, uh, to search across your logs and uh, preferably even aggregate the logs. And the storage needs to be able to handle the load uh, because it can be quite a lot of data and it should be able to, uh, to gracefully get rid of the older logs and uh, provide some tools to manage that. And last but not least, you need to be able to visualize the data. Preferably in some way that you don't become an interface to yet another tool. So you want some tool that you can just give to your boss or, or your developers or your ops people to play around with so they don't constantly bother you. So you can actually finish the next level of Doom. So these are, these are the steps and I'll present here a combination of tools that I personally use and, uh, and not just because I'm paid to do so, 
I actually used them before I was, I was paid to do so. So for the first four steps, we'll look into how Logstash can help you there and how it is equipped and what, are, what the strong points are and what are the other points. Uh, for, for search and aggregation, uh, uh, I, use, I use Elasticsearch for some reasons that will be, that will be mentioned later. And uh, one of those is Kibana, which is a visualization front end for Elasticsearch designed primarily to work with, uh, with the log data. We'll see some examples uh, later, and hopefully if we still have time at the end, we'll actually do a live demo. So, starting with log stash. Yes, that is a log with a stash. So, uh, log stash is a, is a tool to do, uh, to do the collection of loggings, and some uh, can view it as a glorified ETL tool. It has, a, it has the extract uh, part where it actually collects all the data. It has uh, the transform part where it parses and uh, enriches. And then the load where it actually loads it to somewhere to be stored. In uh, Logstash terminology, that's, we have a, always an input. We have a set of filters. And we have an output again. So that's, uh, that's the way how events go through, uh, go through Logstash. So what are the possible, possible inputs? There are quite a few. I'm not going to read this table for you now. Uh, just to mention some, uh, some crucial ones, you can uh, read from a file. Uh, so that will basically keep tailing the file and just, uh, and just process new information. Uh, you can read from a socket and you can read from a few. Those are the three most important, at least for me, inputs uh, for Logstash. So that uh, lets you get the data in, into Logstash. Now you need to do something with the data. So that's where filters actually come in. Again, there is a bunch of filters and I will actually uh, mention a few. Uh, the most important one, uh, at least for me, is Grok. Anybody know? hear what grok actually means? Nice, some, some classic sci-fi readers we have here. So uh, 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 grok is a, is a term coined by, uh, by Robert Heinlein, which means to, to understand, to grasp, or to drink, depending how you look at it, which works in, in, this, case, in this case as well, because the grok is a filter that lets you parse the log file. It's, it's a parsing for humans, as I, as I call it, where it lets you define the fields and the formats that the fiel fields are in, and it will automatically extract those values uh, from the text. Uh, then we have some interesting filters like anonymize, because sometimes you have information in your logs that you don't really want to put in the central store where other people might have access to. So anonymize. You can do CIDR, so you can actually uh, do a test whether an IP address is in a given uh, given uh, sitter segment. KV is another one for parsing for values that are already in key equals value format. GYP, an another enriching one that actually takes an IP address, does a lookup against a GOIP uh, uh, database, and will an uh, insert the, uh, the IP's country and maybe a city, uh, so you can do some interesting aggregations on that or filtering. Uh, metrics to actually calculate some, uh, some metrics on the fly from, uh, from the uh, log stream, uh, user agent to actually parse the user agent string and do something, do something interesting with it. So those are the filters and you will basically be chaining the filters to do what you want. We'll see uh, concrete examples. Once you've done filters, you're, you're ready to actually output the data somewhere. Now you have them in, in a very nice structured way uh, so you can actually store them. Uh, typically what's used is Elasticsearch, uh, but uh, many people actually use, uh, use the log, uh, log as an intermediary step. So they would just feed it again into a few, either Redis, RabbitMQ, uh, ZeroMQ is there somewhere too, or you can, just, you can just feed it somewhere over a network. There are many, many different outputs. Uh, so Again, also my, my favorite one is S STD out. It's otherwise very difficult to, to actually debug what's going on. 
So that concludes the lost fish pipeline. So we, we have an input, so we can read almost, almost anything, or we can make an adapter. Then we have a set of filters and uh, one output uh, per screen. So we can actually configure, with, uh, configure it with more outputs. Uh, more on that later. So if you actually want to give it a try, as is, as is our good motto, you just download it, you run it, you're done. So all you need to do is you supply it with a configuration file. And if you supply that it should start both agent and web, it will actually start a web interface for you on the port 9292 where Kibana will be served. So this is all you need to do to start, uh, to start playing with it. And this is, this is actually what it, will, uh, what it will look like. If I, if I just do, uh, if I just do echo foo into the lost dash with this configuration file, that's what I'll get out. This is the basic structure of an event. This is how all events typically start. So you have the message, which is the whole text. You have the version, which is internal uh, for, in case we ever decide to change the schema, so forward compatibility. And we have, uh, we have the timestamp and the host where it was collected. This is, uh, this is what you get by default. Uh, so uh, you, can, uh, you can see that uh, this is the output. These are just mentioning the things that we, uh, we did. Just uh, be careful that the host is where, th where it was processed. It's automatically inserted where actually uh, the log stash that processed that log was running. So if you actually want to include the source host name, you need to take care of it yourself. It's typically encoded in the message that so you need to you need to actually parse it out. So speaking about parsing, because like just storing the message somewhere, sure, it's still it's still better because now we only have one place to grep, but we are still pretty much limited to grepping. So let's go to parsing. So this is the grok filter. And uh, this is actually uh, a, a formula how to parse the output of, uh, of Redis monitor command. So uh, for those of you familiar with Redis, it's, uh, it's the uh, parsing of the monitor. For those of you that are not familiar with Redis, monitor is a command for Redis that will just keep uh, printing all the commands that are going into Redis. It's internally, it's used for replication. Externally, it's very useful if you want to see what's going on in your Redis instance. So I also was curious what was happening on all my Redis instances all over the world. So I created this parser. So uh, I, I, here I'm telling uh, Grok that, I'm, that the text is contained in the field message. It starts with a, with a number that I call timestamp uh, and a number that I call database, an IP address that I'll call client, port, there is a command, and then there is anything else that, I, that are just parameters for, for the command that I call params. And I just want to output everything into, uh, onto the command line in a, in a debug format. Uh, the next step I want to do is I just want to replace the, the date that was otherwise injected by logstash, and I actually want to use the date stored in the log file. I want to I use, use the timestamp which is in the Unix format, so here I'm specifying the format, and I also want to remove it after I'm done because I don't want to store it twice. So this is what I get out. Uh, this, is, this is the source line, which is still stored under, under message. I just didn't want to copy it over. I still get uh, the version, but the timestamp is actually uh, now taken from, uh, taken from this. You can see 263, 263, I didn't lie much. Uh, type is source, uh, type is Redis because that was specified in the config file. Uh, you have the host name again where it was actually run and everything else is parsed from there. So you have the command and the parameter. So super simple, uh, super simple parsing, parsing for humans and at this point in the log stash pipeline, we have a concrete example 
and everything is parsed out as we want it. We can search on it now very nicely. If we, if we are interested in what uh, Redis commands did this IP address run, then it's a simple filtering, and it, or if we want to see breakdown by commands. Again, something that's very possible. But so far, we've, st we've still been, uh, with this configuration uh, file, we've still been just writing, to writing this standard out. So we want to we wanna store it to, uh, to Elasticsearch, which is actually pretty easy. We just add an output. Either we replace the one that's there, or we can add another one, because we can al uh, always have multiple outputs. Elasticsearch HTTP. It's on localhost, it's, it's on port 9200. Of course, these are the default values, so I could have left them out, but I want to be something on the slide. And that's all I really need to, uh, to configure Logstash to actually read from sender it in. So this is still assumes that I'm, I'm pip piping the data in, and it will actually read the data, parse the data, uh, and store the data in Elasticsearch. So this is the this is the Logstash pipeline, and how it actually works inside is this. So uh, Logstash is written entirely in Ruby, but for for production use, we heavily recommend that you use actually JRuby to run it. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't run in any other way. So recommendation might be a little uh, misleading. And each of, each of the different phases have, have worker pools. So there is a worker pool for, for the input readers. There is one for each filter, which you can configure in size. Uh, the size queue is used to, to, pa uh, to pass the messages from one, uh, one worker pool to, uh, to the other. And uh, the only difference uh, is input, which is typically single-threaded, and output, which is also typically single-threaded, but since 1.3, we actually added an option for those to be multi-threaded too, because sometimes you're writing to, uh, to a storage that uh, uh, deals better with, with parallel loading and will actually block otherwise. If you're more interested, uh, there's a life of an event, if you just uh, search logstash life of an event, it goes into detail how things actually go, uh, go through logstash and what happens, what happens where. So that, that's, been, that's been the world's quickest overview of, lo of what lo logstash does. So do we have any questions for, for logstash itself? Yes. from journal D. I don't know. Uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there is one other thing uh, that I actually skipped because I didn't want to go into it. And when we, uh, when we read something from an input, uh, there we can also associate a codec uh, with the input. One example of a codec that we have internally is JSON. So we can actually read uh, uh, logs in that are that are in JSON and we can skip the parsing because it's already pre-parsed uh, which is which is pretty good so this would be this would typically be a, uh, a codec thing so you would uh, you would with input you would specify that you read from a command output or from uh, or from a socket or whatever and then you would either have to find or just write your own codec that will actually just recognize that format and deserialize it into uh, into Ruby essentially so uh, again, all these filters are just are just very simple, uh, very simple pieces of Ruby code. So writing something like this should be should be fairly easy. Sure. It will process all of it. So if you point it to a f it w if you point it to a file. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll repeat the question. Thank you. Uh, if there is any batch processing, uh, so by default it does uh, batch processing. For example, if you point it to a file, it will start reading the file from the top. 
and when it gets to, to the end, it will just wait and, and keep tailing the file. So essentially it is, it is batch, batch processing, but then it can go into, into screen mode afterward. Uh, many people actually use it when they have like batch processing load jobs for, for their data stores. They still use Logstash because of, of the parsing and, and the infrastructure part that we'll be talking about later. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. For example, for the Apache, there is just one, one line, just say, this is an Apache log format. We already know all about it, so we'll parse it for you. And there is actually, yes, a library. Also, how, how syslog typically stores, format, uh, stores date and all these all this different parts, so you can just compose it. In my example, I use the IP and Word and stuff like that. There is a, there's a big library of those. And if you're not satisfied, Underneath the hood, those are really just regular expressions, so you can just you can just start adding to the library from your own part and and uh, enrich it. So, so this host is the host. Uh, so the question was, uh, if if Logstash has any mechanism uh, to prevent spoofing or tampering with the or with the data. Uh, so, the, for example, the host it's inserted by Logstash. So there is no way to tamper with that un unless you can change the host name of the of the computer. At which point, like, what's what's the point of spoofing some logs? Uh, other than that, everything is up to you. Like whatever you whatever you configure, there are some filters that will actually enable. Uh, uh, enable uh, encryption uh, for for the log shippers and uh, uh, some uh, some filters that will do signing. So you can actually, when you read the uh, when you read the record, you can sign it and ship it over to to Logstash for processing, and then it can verify uh, verify the signage. Uh, but that's something that you have to do with uh, with the filters. Okay, I'm gonna one last question, and then we'll move on, and we'll have hopefully more time for questions at the end. Not not a bite more uh, bite less. Uh, so the question is how uh, how is the the memory usage looking? It really depends what you're doing. Uh, like obviously it's JRuby, so it has some baseline, but it's not too bad from from what we have seen. Uh, I I cannot unfortunately give you give you an exact numbers. So if we get to the demo, we can look. So moving on, Logstash is just is just one part of of the stack that that we lovingly call uh, an Elk stack because it's Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And uh, it's, it's the first step. So a typical, a typical Logstash deployment would look something like this. Uh, you have a log shipper, then you have Logstash, and you store everything in Elasticsearch, and you visualize with Kibana. So log shipper, uh, formerly known as Lumberjack, is a tiny agent because typically on, on, your, on your production machines, you don't want to run the full log stash because of, for example, memory configurations. So you just uh, have tiny log shipper, which is a, which is a binary. Uh, I believe it's written in Go, but I could be mistaken. That just takes the logs, it does, it does all, the, all the input things, and just ship it over to log stash. It will actually encrypt it and send it over, over the network uh, to log stash. So log stash will have as an input it will have a, a, a network socket uh, to which the, the shipper will just write to. And this will do all the parsing and enriching and everything, and then store it, uh, store it in Elasticsearch. So that's the, that's the baseline. Of course, uh, typically that's not very nice because communicating just over a socket, so if you do a restart of, of, uh, of Logstash, things will be lost. So what you typically want to do is you want to insert a queue in the middle, uh, so you have more uh, you have more leeway, and also uh, so that you can actually scale out. You can just have more log shippers on multiple servers, all writing to a centralized queue, log stash reading from it, parsing and loading it uh, somewhere. 
And of course, I, I assume you all know where, where the slide is going in, in the next one. Of course, you can have a cluster, uh, cluster of, of brokers. And surprisingly enough, uh, at that point, you can have, you can have multiple, uh, multiple OXX workers. I am sorry, I, I just don't have another slide with clustered Elasticsearch. That's just cluster by default. Like, there's, there's no, no way to do that. Also, I'm running out of, uh, out of space on the slide. So this is typically how you how you scale uh, scale Logstash. We've we've seen deploy uh, we've seen deployments in the wild that uh, that have several billions of documents loaded every day, uh, perfectly uh, perfectly fine, stored for uh, stored for a week. At that point, storing is just uh, it's just a matter of money. How much hardware you can dedicate to Elasticsearch, and uh, it works it works pretty nicely. Of course, for for deployment of this size, there's some tuning to be done. Uh, you need to uh, need to fine tune the queue and uh, and everything, uh, but it can definitely be done. So, moving on, this is this is how this how the stack integrates together. Of course. Uh, so as, as you've just seen, we have we have stickers here afterwards. If you, if you're interested, they are quite popular, so they might be gone. So be sure to grab one. Uh, so this is this is how the stack fits together. How the individual components work together. Uh, some people even do that after log stash that just does the parsing and enriching. You have another layer of queues and another layer of log stashes just to do the loading. Because because they can. So that really, uh, re it really depends on, on your uh, on your needs. It's the it's the typical Unix architecture: do one thing, do it well. So Logstash doesn't do queuing; it relies on some on some other component. Let's say hmm, a queue to do the queuing for it. And uh, while we are on the subject of other components, enter Kibana. Kibana is an application that communicates with Elasticsearch. It's a, it's a pure JavaScript thing that only runs in your browser. So there are advantages to that and disadvantages. The advantages is that it's ultimately super easy to scale Kibana because everybody has a browser, right? No? Okay, I'll work on my jokes. Uh, and uh, the, sec uh, the disadvantage is that everybody who uses Kibana needs to get, have access to Elasticsearch because Kibana directly uh, issues requests to Elasticsearch and uh, does the search. There are some ways to log down Elasticsearch, but it needs, it needs some cooperation and it's a non-trivial operation. So unless you have, uh, you have the advantage of being on a closed network or you use a, or you use a VPN, then you need to pay some attention into, into securing Kibana. The good news is because it's all HTTP, uh, there, are, there are many, many people in the world who can help you with setting up an HTTP proxy and perhaps doing some SSL and HTTP auth and uh, other, other interesting, very interesting stuff like that. So how does it, how does it actually look when you, when, you just wanna, when you just wanna visualize some, uh, some search data, uh, some log data? So this is uh, this is a typical view uh, of a Kibana panel, except this is a this is a non-standard uh, layout. Typically, it's black. But so you uh, you see the individual log, uh, log files down here. So you can you can uh, you can pagitate through them, but that's not very interesting. What's interesting is the one here. When here I'm actually doing five searches. So in this case, I'm searching for file extensions. And I'm visualizing all of them at once, how many were there over time, how many were there in total, and I can just click on anything and start filtering and immediately start drilling down. So uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the white uh, layout. This is actually the default one. So this is, again, the same thing. So you have the, you have the time-based data. So this, this has been manually created uh, from experience, uh, this is what lets you immediately see that there has been something going wrong. 
And since Kibana lets you automatically just just point and drag and zoom into uh, zoom into that uh, that area, you can start examining the logs from that period when there was apparently something wrong with your infrastructure because not all the requests were going through, or there was some there was some other mistake. And again, we see we see breakdown uh, breakdown by uh, by tags and some uh, and some other filtering. Uh, of course, we can do we can do geo and geo aggregation, and when you enrich the data actually from from the geo IP, uh, you can actually have have pretty pretty maps, uh, uh, the same as the same as Google Analytics pretty much. So, there are some other tools to help you uh, help you store and manage your logs. Uh, notably, there is uh, there is Curator, which is a tiny uh, tiny script that will actually uh, help you manage manage the data that you're storing. Uh, so what Logstash does is it's typically it would store uh, the data per day in Elasticsearch. So Curator is a tool that lets you control how many uh, how many days you have actually stored and lets you do stuff like move all the old data into another cluster or uh, have them uh, have them stripped down of of some of some data structures. So sure, search will be slower, but they will be taking up less space. Lets you uh, close the the indices. So let's say that you want to cl uh, close every, any index that's more than two weeks old. So it will still sit on disk. You can still reopen it and start searching, but by default, it will eat note resources and it will not be available for search. And uh, that's that's really it. Uh, how much time do we have left for demo? Nine minutes. Okay, that's a challenge. So first things first. This is actually Kibana on the Redis data. So you can see that just by loading the data, I have I have the distribution here. This is actually per second, so you see here that I, I did uh, 1,500, uh, 1500 c uh, commands per second. I actually loaded some data uh, from production. And uh, here you can see it breaking down by, by commands. If I wanted to play around uh, with it a little, a little bit more, I could actually configure Logstash because I have multi and exec, so that's like grouping of commands in, in Redis, so theoretically I could group them one into uh, all into into one record if I wanted to, and I can see I can see the the IP addresses of uh, of all the all the clients that that made uh, that made requests uh, to to Redis, and here I see the individual individual records. So you can see you can see the commands that were being run, all the parameters, the client IP addresses. So for example, you can see who has been doing. Uh, LN, so I just click on it, everything is now filtered, so now I have the LN. Uh, theoretically, I could now do another facet over, over this, another distribution, so it, could, it would give me the most used uh, lists in my, in my Redis. So uh, something that's, uh, that's immediately, immediately fairly useful. Now we can also see who actually did, uh, did what. So I can just filter just one client, and now here I see all the filters that I have. So if I get rid of the one for uh, length, so now I can see all the requests just from uh, just from one client. Uh, to show you, um, where are we? To show you just how everything looks, so uh, if I if I just run the demo, and start producing something, it takes a while to start up. We are actually uh, actually working on it, so in the new version should be much quicker to to start up. So now we can actually run Redis commands here and see the see the outputs here. So you can see everything like this is this is the name of my machine, uh, this is the command, and you can actually see everything how it's uh, how it's going through. And 
I wasn't lying. It's really, uh, really the example that I give on the slide. So just, uh, just the input here. I'm assigning the type. So later on, if I if I need to have some expressions, I can actually uh, filter by filter by type. I can have different filters per type, or anything like that. Here is the graph definition, and here is uh, here is the mapping from uh, from timestamp uh, to the to the internal timestamp that we'll be later using for visualization. And the output, just for just for standard out, I also have a file that I actually used for loading all the data that I, that you saw previously into into Elasticsearch using the Elasticsearch HTTP. And that's all, folks. So if you have if you have any any questions, yes. So uh, in my previous company, when I actually played with this uh, with this a little bit more, uh, we did mm, several million a day, uh, a million of, of log lines, a million of uh, log records. There are oh, in gigabytes. Uh, that would be two or three gigabytes, I believe. I might be wrong. Uh, uh, the biggest. Uh, the biggest deployment we've we've seen so far is somebody actually indexing close to a terabyte a day uh, through through the whole Logstash, Logstash pipeline and, and storing it in in Elasticsearch, uh, and uh, there's still there's still room for improvement there. The, the the customer just doesn't have any more data, so we we don't know. Yeah, that should be that should be fine. Sure, and it also depends on the hardware primarily, but. So the question was, what, what are, what's the query language and if there are other, any other solutions that are comparable? Yes, so. Uh, so yes, so so the comparison with Splunk is that uh, we uh, Elasticsearch cannot do any, uh, everything that Splunk can, but it can do some things that Splunk cannot. So this is really not uh, not something that's generally answerable. Uh, we've had many people that migrated actually from Splunk to Elasticsearch and Logstash, and they are reasonably happy. Some of them miss. Uh, one or two features, but are super happy about some other features they got they didn't uh, didn't know they could. So uh, if you're interested, come talk to me later, and we can we can maybe deal with specifics. There is another question. No. Uh, yes, but everything is HTTP. Uh, uh, the the uh, so I'm sorry. The the question was uh, access control in Elasticsearch. So we don't do it b uh, by default, but everything is HTTP and is properly structured. Yes, free for all. Inside of Elasticsearch. Yes. There's a question. So in the in the shipper, so the question is if there if there is anything that can be done in the shipper so that we don't have to ship ship everything. So yes, absolutely. Uh, you can even use Logstash itself as the as the shipper, and at that point it's really up to you to to uh, to decide how much processing you want to do on the on the in the agent, uh, in the shipper, because it will it will of course consume some CPU which you're taking away from your production systems. Uh, so it's it's the balance with CPU versus uh, CPU and memory versus network. Typically, people say just just use the network. We just don't want to uh, don't want to fiddle with it. Uh, but it's it's definitely up to you, and you can do some more stuff in in the shipper. Another question. So the question is whether there is a community library. Uh, there is. 
so first, uh, first, uh, what there is is for the Grok filter. There are many, uh, many different inputs in different formats, but those are typically for individual fields. Uh, but then there is uh, Logstash cookbook, which you can just find. Uh, you can just f uh, find online, and there are recipes that people actually uh, that people actually did uh, with Logstash, and some of them are open to sharing it. Uh, one last question. So somebody else, you already had yours. There was another one. So, so the question is uh, some more advanced reporting if I need to do more. So you have, you have the entire power of Elasticsearch to, to utilize. You don't have to go through Kibana. Kibana is just, just the, 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 uh, the convenient uh, front end for it. You can just go directly to, to Elasticsearch through your application. And of course, you can just get the data out of Elasticsearch so you can filter it, uh, uh, limit it in Elasticsearch, then get it out. And uh, you can load it into Hadoop and, and do whatever there. You can even uh, actually use uh, Hadoop as a backend, uh, Elasticsearch as a backend for some for some Hadoop stuff if you want to do really really custom and uh, intensive operations. But typically, people are just fine with Elasticsearch queries. And that's all, folks. I'll be uh, I'll be outside. Have some stickers. And thank you for having me. <laughs>